Hey, everyone. Welcome to Things We Said Today, a bi-weekly Beatles podcast where we discuss anything and everything about the Beatles, whether the band together or we talk about the individual members of the Beatles and their projects as solo artists. My name is Darren DeVivo from WFUV Radio in New York City. Uh, We're a non-commercial radio station at 90.7 FM. And you could listen uh, there if you're in the New York City tri-state area. Uh, But you could check us out uh, online anywhere in the world at WFUV.org. You can also listen to our app. You have to download it first. Doesn't work unless you download it. And then you could listen to FUV on our app. And if you have a smart speaker, which I don't, so I don't know how these things work. But you supposedly can say play WFUV and uh, you can get us that way. Uh, so I've been at WFUV since 1984, uh, and I'm thrilled every two weeks to hang out with my friends uh, that co-host this show with me here. First up, Ken Michaels, a Beatle expert that you've been listening to on the radio now for approximately 40 years, hosting all kinds of different Beatle programs. At the moment, he hosts the syndicated Beatles radio show, Every Little Thing. Uh, he's the co-host here at Things We Said Today. He's also the co-host of the video cast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And uh, he has his own YouTube channel, which he calls Ken Michaels Radio. Uh, and, and Ken, it's great to have you back on board. Good to be with you, Darren. And, yes. Alan, and looking forward to the show, as always. And Alan Cozen, you know Alan from uh, all the great uh, writing that he's done through the years for the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, several books about the Beatles, and now the anticipation is picking up for a book that he is co-writing with Adrian Sinclair, and it's called The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, 1969 to 1973, and I have it on good authority there's going to be further volumes. Uh, of the McCartney legacy. Uh, Alan Cozen, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Alan. How are you? Hey, Darren. How's it going? Uh, welcome to this uh, this edition of Things We Said Today, which is going to be a bit of a, a birthday celebration, uh, having uh, just uh, celebrated Paul McCartney's 80th birthday. If time allows, we may uh, blow a candle out for Ringo, uh, who will be turning 82 on July 7th. Of course, Paul turned 80 uh, just a couple of weeks ago on uh, the 18th of June, a Saturday. Uh, what we're going to do, uh, again, the, as long as time works out for us, uh, we're going to definitely take a look at the, some of our favorite deep, obscure uh, tracks from Paul McCartney. And again, if we have the time for Ringo, if not, we'll maybe do it next time. Um And we're also going to talk a bit about Paul McCartney's show as he uh, uh, brought this leg of the Got Back Tour to an end uh, with a show in New Jersey and East Rutherford at MetLife Stadium. And of course, follow that with his uh, appearance at the Glastonbury Festival. Uh, So we'll talk a bit about that. But before we get into McCartney, his 80th birthday, the concerts and our favorite deep tracks and a nod to Ringo as well. Let's go to Ken Michaels with the news. All right. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Before we talk about mainly Paul, I just want to let everyone know, in case they don't know this already, since we talked about Ringo's All-Star Band and the fact that he had to postpone shows till September because two of the members of the All-Stars came down with COVID, Ringo announced that he was going to be um, posting the dates, the rescheduled dates on his website. He has done just so. Those rescheduled shows will happen from September the 5th through the 22nd. Now, the second leg of his tour starts (laughs) September 23rd, and it runs uh, through October the 20th, and that's 20 dates. So 12 remaining dates from the first leg, another 20 for the second leg, 32 dates over about seven weeks' time. That's pretty demanding for anybody, let alone someone who's about to turn 82. But uh, check ringostar.com and you'll see the new dates for the first leg of the tour. All right, we mentioned Paul appearing at Glastonbury uh, this past Saturday. But before that, on Friday night, he actually played a warm-up show at a place called The Cheese and Grain in Frome, Somerset. 
There were 25 songs in the set list, a shorter show, and in attendance were Olivia Harrison, actress Leslie Mann, pop star Olivia Rodrigo, and ACDC's Brian Johnston. Every song in this show was a song that he's been doing on his current tour, with one exception. He performed From Me to You at this show. The Glastonbury Festival happened over this weekend. Uh, Paul played the same set list that uh, he's been doing on the tour, but he had two special guests come up on stage, one of which was Dave Grohl, who uh, joined Paul on I Saw Her Standing There and Ben on the Run. And once again, Bruce Springsteen, who was a special guest that turned up at MetLife in New Jersey, came up on stage with Paul and did the same two songs he did at MetLife, that being Glory Days and I Want to Be Your Man. And at the very end of the concert, Dave and Bruce jammed with Paul and the band for the end and exchanged lead guitar solos, which is pretty cool. And actually, during the MetLife show, Bruce joined the band, too, for the end. We'll be talking a little bit more about the Glastonbury Festival in just a bit. Um, as we said, Paul turned 80 on June the 18th. Um, on the on the previous day, June seventeenth, there came the announcement of a new box set with all three of Paul McCartney's DIY albums, McCartney, McCartney Two, and McCartney Three, all packaged together, which will be available as a black vinyl release, also in colored vinyl, and on CD. All three formats will include three special photo prints from Paul about each album. It also has newly created uh, box set cover art and typography for the slipcase provided by Ed Rusha. The box sets will be available on August the 5th and you can pre-order them now. Also on Paul's birthday for record release day uh, came the limited edition 12 inch for Paul's song from McCartney 3, Women and Wives. Side A has Paul's version, side B the one from St. Vincent from the McCartney 3 Imagined release. Only 3,000 copies will be available worldwide for that. From the excellent, always excellent Facebook page, The Beatles in Print Together in Solo, we learn of a new book coming out in September in the UK and next February in the US, and it's called <laughs> Love and Let Die. The Beatles, James Bond, and the British Psyche by John Higgs, described as a deep dive into the unique connections between the two titans of the British cultural psyche, the Beatles and the Bond films, and what they tell us about class, sexuality, and our aspirations over 60 dramatic years. Just when you thought there were no new ideas for a Beatle book of any kind, <laughs> combining the Beatles and James Bond for that. Also from the Beatles in print together and solo Facebook page, we learn of an album just released by a group called the Vague Ideas. The album's called the John Lennon Letters. Originally planned as a stage play by writer and musician Mayor Rozelle, New York Letters is based on fictional letters either written or received by John Lennon the last nine years of his life. So there are 12 songs on the album, and to give you an idea, each song represents a letter that John wrote to someone or someone wrote to him. There's an opening track, NYC, New York City, a letter he wrote to his mother, Julia. And then there are songs based on letters that John wrote to Yoko, May Pang, Julian, Aunt Mimi, Sean, Tricky Dicky, <laughs> the song called Nixon's Listening, and a song that he wrote to Paul or letter that he wrote to Paul. Uh, the song for Paul is called No More Crying, and it's a message song sort of in response to Paul's oh. here today. And there's a song based on an imaginary letter that Paul wrote to John called Something Will Happen. It was released in the UK, and uh, you can purchase it now on Amazon. Don't know about a US release though, but it is a UK release. A few other news items, Julian Lennon announced on his website that you can now pre-order his forthcoming album, Jude, with no information on its release date, but the album will contain 11 new songs from him, including the two just released 
that we mentioned before, Every Little Moment and Freedom, and two new videos are available to watch for the songs Breathe and Save Me. Uh, Peter Asher just finished up four concerts. Um, actually, Jeremy Clyde of Chad and Jeremy fame was supposed to join him for the tour of those four shows, but he also came down with COVID. So it was strictly a Peter's solo show. I got to see the last of the four. It was wonderful. Always get it. If you get a chance to see Peter, don't miss it. He mixes amazing stories about his career, Peter and Gordon period, working with the Beatles, having Paul McCartney live in the Asher household, working at Apple, the people he's produced. Um, Peter, as a matter of fact, told me that he's producing a new album for Susanna Hoffs, which should be out in the fall. Billy J. Kramer will be giving a concert at Daryl's house in Pauling, New York. The date for that is August the 6th. Also, Bob Berger, known for being in The Weaklings, will have his new CD out on July the 1st. It's called The Domino Effect, which I have right here. It's 11 new songs from Bob. It's really great power pop, well-crafted songs, melodic songs. You can pre-order the CD. It's also available on MP3 on Amazon. And I'm actually giving away copies through my weekly Beatles trivia on my website at kenmichaelsradio.com. Um, there's a brand new issue of Recording Magazine that has the Beatles on the front cover with the title, Digging Into Get Back, with a photo from those sessions. And also, let us not forget, the documentary for Get Back comes out on July the 12th. That'll be on DVD and Blu-ray. And since we also sent out uh, birthday wishes, of course, to Paul McCartney turning 80, let us not forget Brian Wilson also turned 80. And that was on June the 20th. All right. That's all the news I got. And Ken, while, you're, while you were uh, doing the news, I, I'm realizing this is not a religious experience happening here. While you're doing the news, it was just like this golden ray of sunshine came down on my face here. Not like, uh -huh. Kind of like that. Not quite like that. I, I'm actually finding the last few shows, I, I do it by the window here, and every show it like acts differently so now the sun's gonna come right down in my eyes two weeks ago uh we recorded a little later in the day and it got very dark so i put on some lamps and then all of a sudden it was like i was in a disco um well, discos aren't light you get the point but anyway uh it's it's natural light here dropping down on my head anyway thank you ken for the news and while you were doing the news i was thinking about how you know Ken goes through all of the, you know, the new releases, books coming out and whatnot. Uh, just yesterday, I got my copies of the, uh, the Claypool Lennon Delirium, the two albums on colored vinyl, which is pretty crazy looking. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also want to give a thumbs up to that uh, Bob Berger uh, album, which uh, I've uh, only heard once uh, and uh, was pretty cool stuff. Uh, so check that out. And if you know the weaklings, then you already got a bit of a head start. Uh, what's the name of the album again? It's Ken? called The Domino Effect right here. You're gonna, oh. you're gonna catch a lot of, um, well, Beatles influence, obviously. Mm -hmm. but I also hear a little Tom Petty in there. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just did an interview with Bob. And part of the reason why I wanted to do the interview is because he revealed on Facebook that his favorite artist in the world next to the Beatles is Elvis Costello. So I thought, hey, let's talk about Paul and Elvis's work together. Right. And combine that with the new album and talk about the Weaklings. And you can hear a little bit of Elvis Costello uh, on this album, especially on, um, well, the second track called Impression. Has an Elvis Costello squeeze kind of feel to it. Mm -hmm. We talk about that in the, um, in the interview, which is on my YouTube channel. And this is really not big news because uh, these, these publications come out fairly often. Uh, because of McCartney's birthday, there, I noticed there were some like the uh, magazines starting to pop up uh, in stores. There's a Life magazine edition on Paul's 80th. Time has one, I believe. Uh, I just recently found uh, a couple of uh, brand new Get Back books, which doesn't have to do books, magazines, which doesn't have to do. Yeah, that's the Time one. Uh, yeah. There's a Life one, too. I don't know if you have that there. No. Uh, People, I think, also has something new. 
a special edition, but I see, I should have these things handy. It's all, all the way over there. Uh, and uh, it's a spe- I think it's uh, on the Beatles, though, and Get Back. But uh, uh, By the way, let me, let me add one thing since I mentioned yeah. Elvis Costello. I neglected to mention that as a tribute to Paul, Elvis Costello uh, posted a performance that he did. He made a video of him doing Here, There, and Everywhere, which was really nice. And Sean Lennon did the same thing. He right. also covered Here, There, and Everywhere, which you can check, uh, check out on YouTube. Really nice covers. All nice right. Props from both. And I also just uh, ordered the other day, I pre-ordered um, a couple of things that you mentioned. Uh, Julian Lennon, I, I, I uh, pre-ordered the, uh, the CD. Um, and I think if you look on his website, you get a general sense of around when the album's coming out. I don't know it off the top of my head. It's very soon. And um, I was also surprised, pleasantly surprised, that he has a lot of older releases still available and the prices are ridiculously low uh mm. so they're clearly looking to clear uh clear out a stock room um for example there was that special box set for the last album everything changes right uh and that's available and it's dirt cheap and i never did buy it when it became available so i kind of did a little uh julian lennon stocking up while i was on his website uh and again, I went there initially to uh, pre-order the album. I also found one other thing. I don't know if anyone else uh, watching right now had, uh, had the same experience. I tried to place a, a pre-order for the Blu-ray edition of The Beatles Get Back. And I was having problems finding the Blu-ray on Amazon. Sometimes Amazon can get very difficult when you try to locate a specific... Um, you know, a specific release, like if you want to, um, like, for example, uh, when I'm buying video games for my son for the holidays or birthday or something, sometimes uh, you'll, without even realizing it, be buying uh, uh, an edition for, say, the European market. It won't play on, uh, you know, North American players. Same thing with uh, some DVDs and stuff. I just couldn't in Blu-ray discs. I could not find... Um, and I don't know if it's changed since then, but this was almost a week ago, uh, get back on Blu-ray on Amazon. Um, so I had to go digging around some other places for it, but uh, I don't know if anyone else has found that. Usually found whenever I buy one item, mm-hmm. I have a local store that I go to. I only use Amazon when I buy a whole bunch of stuff all at once, mm-hmm. but um, yeah, and I want to get it that day and they'll have it for me. Mm-hmm. So. Oh, and one more thing. I don't mean to uh, delay getting to the, the main topic of the show. Uh, the Women and Wives 12-inch single for Record Store Day. I didn't realize how uh, hard to find that was going to be. Uh, and usually I miss out on the things that become hard to find. But uh, my local store had two copies of the single and you can only buy one. Uh, so I was able to get it. And it seems like it is pretty hard to find right now sometimes these record store day releases will linger if there's not a big demand Mm -hmm. uh women and wives seem to have vanished and it's all over ebay for you know close to a hundred bucks or more you know the bidding maybe is reasonable but you know by the time a week goes by the bidding is going to jack up over a uh to over a hundred dollars so for some reason Women and wives, uh, poof. I couldn't find it. And yeah. I, was the, I was the eighth person online and I didn't get it. And oh. then I went to a second store and they didn't have it either. Um, and again, my store who did not, this particular store really doesn't go out, go overboard with getting a lot of the titles. Uh, he gets what he can get. Mm-hmm. And he had to, uh, he had said on his Facebook page, that he'd have three copies. Uh, there were two, and I was not there when the store opened. I was a good half an hour or so, you know. So um, people wanted that 12-inch single or somebody, or or there's a lot of them still sitting in a warehouse somehow, somewhere. They're all on eBay. Aren't <laughs> most of these collector's items, aren't they, for the most part, 3,000 copies? It just seems like every time I report them, that's how many they make when it comes to Paul. 
I don't know. I never look at that number because I don't believe it to begin with. <laughs> I've always felt like if they say only 300 made, uh, 3,000 made, I'm thinking to myself, yeah, and there's another 3,000 someplace else. Um, I don't know. I never really pay attention to them. If I want something, I'm going to more times than not find it. Some people may have to like go missing, never to be found again in my quest to find these records, but hmm. nobody's laughing. That was my nice way that I'll go to any length. Anyway. Uh, we have a theme, folks, and <laughs> it's not talking randomly about records we can't find. Uh, Paul McCartney, and this just, I can't wrap my, my head around this. Paul McCartney's 80 years old, folks, and he just celebrated his 80th birthday on uh, June 16th. 18th. 18th, sorry. I knew I was going to do that because the show at MetLife Stadium was the 16th. Right. Um, and uh, both Ken and I, had the pleasure of catching the show in East Rutherford, New Jersey at MetLife Stadium, the home of the Jets and the Giants, one of the ugliest stadiums, in my opinion, out there. And it's a new stadium. It is just a big concrete behemoth, a gray. It has no personality. <laughs> Boom. It just dropped out of the sky next to the old Giants stadium. Um but uh, we were there for uh, Paul McCartney. Ken was there. I was there. And it was the final show of this leg of the Got Back tour. Because Paul has said there'll be further shows. Nothing's been announced yet. No specifics about it. But you just get the impression that, all right, that was, this was the end of this leg of Got Back. He'll be back at some point, maybe later in the year or next year, to be seen. But... Um, the final show was in uh, at, at MetLife Stadium. And um, go to you, Ken, and um, share your experience about, about uh, the event, the day, and the concert itself. Well, first of all, let me just say that um, I felt like I was really spoiled that day because my wife and I decided we didn't really know what the traffic situation was going to be, so we left extra early. We got, we got into the parking lot. And um, we parked very close to the stadium. This was around four o'clock and we got to hear the sound check. Hmm. Clear as that, wasn't, that wasn't your plan? No. <laughs> I just wanted to get there and have a, you know, a, you know, a parking space and be ready. I didn't know what the situation was going to be traffic wise. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to take any risks. So I left extra early. And uh, I got to hear from the outside. I mean, there's only a few other cars around us. There was no noise around us from the fans. And so I got to hear the band play all the songs that they did in the soundcheck. And there were times when Paul vocally sounded fantastic. And I'm saying to myself, what are you doing? Save it for the concert. <laughs> you know, at the times he was singing real high notes and I couldn't believe, you know, for all we're, we're, we're so critical of the voice well many of us are we keep talking about it all the time and sometimes when you hear it in the clear like this it's a revelation to know that he's still quite capable of singing this well and i think that um we all kind of know if you look at the set lists of what he does um in the sound checks that they're they're kind of similar he almost always does some 50s rock and roll he did matchbox did lady madonna um Got to try and remember some of the others that did Letting Go. Um, that's His voice was fantastic in Letting Go. Um, but I wasn't expecting that to happen. So for, for my day to start that way, um, remembering he did Coming Up, <laughs> he did Let Him In, the songs will come to me. Did you catch the entire sound? Was it like when you pulled into your parking spot, was it quiet? Was there, had he, had he started yet? He'd already started. I... I I, when I got there, it was in the middle of letting go. Oh, he did women and wives during the sound check. So I was kind of hoping he would do that in concert, but he started doing it at the very beginning of the tour. He was alternating that with let him in. And uh, in the concert that we saw, he, he did let him in. But um, the band sounded great. And the sound check lasted for probably 50 minutes, I would say, 50 minutes to an hour. So um, we just sat in our car and listened and got treated to this. 
That means he played close to four up. Uh, wait, Matt's involved here. Yeah, four hours that day. But he does that with every concert. He always does a sound check. I know, I know that, but it's just the show is a little longer, which we'll get to because of the guests, mm -hmm. uh, than I think most of the shows during the tour uh, that had that came before. That's a that's a lot for someone who was days away from turning eighty to be performing and doing close to four hours of, of music with just a little break there. Right. Um, so you, you were able to, the logistics, you were, got there early and you had the, uh, the treat of being there for the sound check. Um, as for me, I mean, I also, uh, you were texting me uh, and I'm running around the house thinking, you know, traffic's been bad getting anywhere lately, it seems. Um, and I'm trying to leave the house early and I see Ken, I'm in the parking lot listening to the sound check. And I'm like, ah. <laughs> I didn't even think that. I'm just thinking, just get there. So I'm not in a crazed rush, you know, trying to get to my seat when the show is going to start in two minutes. Mm -hmm. um, for a, a huge entertainment complex, I'm happy that I kind of flew right in once I got near the stadium and got a good spot and everything was fine. And... Um, uh, and they got inside. And for me, and I let this affect my enjoying the show at the beginning, um, I had purchased my tickets that I had bought were in the front row of uh, the 100s, the mm -hmm. lower, lowest level in the stadium seating. So I wasn't on the field. I was just above the field. So if it was a football game, I was sitting in one of the end zones. Uh, and if you've ever watched a game where a guy scores a touchdown and he decides to jump the wall into the crowd to celebrate with the fans, that's right where I was sitting. So if it were a football game, he would have jumped right into my arms. Um, so when I bought the tickets, I was thrilled to be in the front row uh, and not have to deal with standing for the entire show on the field, which was exactly what ended up happening. Everybody with, with floor seats on the field itself stood the entire show. Mm. Um, there would be nobody in front of me. Uh, as uh, I'm walking down, I was with my daughter going down the steps. It seemed to take forever. And I'm thinking to myself, they couldn't design the stadium any better. This is the longest group of steps going down a one section I've ever gone down. And the way I walk, as I got close to my seat, I realized these are obstructed view seats. And when we sat down right smack way, way off in the distance, but blocking two thirds of the stage was one of the monitors. And it was encased in like gray, like a box, which was canvas, I guess to protect it from the weather. So you had the sound desk and Ken saw it from where he is. The sound desk had the, uh, gray tent over it and surrounding it and two monitors on either side of the sound desk. Hmm. Um, and one of those monitors was right in my line of vision. Uh, so I did not see two thirds of the stage at all. That's and true. so I immediately, that ends up like ruining the beginning of my evening, you know, because the more and more I think about it, I'm thinking how much I spent. Is this going to be my last chance to see Paul? Um, I brought my daughter. You know, we got to have a, we have to have a monitor all the way. So I spoke to some ushers. They couldn't help me. Um, I spoke to somebody at the stadium, um, guest relations. They told me, well, you bought a constructed view seats. And I'm like, no, I didn't. Nowhere when I purchased my tickets from those uh, rocket scientists at, at, at Ticketmaster did it say, obstructed view or I wouldn't have bought them. Uh, so that kind of did take away a bit the experience, kind of a little bit of the air came out of the balloon. Uh, and then the show starts, we're maybe about, I don't know, a quarter of the way in. And I don't know what happened, but somebody sitting two seats, three seats to my left needed medical attention. I don't know if they fainted. Somebody said she's having a stroke. Uh, next thing I know, they clear our row out and put us down on the field 
so that the paramedics can get to this particular person. Uh, so again, distractions uh, taking me away from the show. So that really didn't help. And uh, it took like just, good thing it was a three hour concert because it took time for me to kind of get my head into it. And then when I did, uh, probably well, maybe just after half the halfway point, uh, I was finally kind of focused in there. And, you know, it's a little frustrating when you spend what you spend to have to watch uh, screens. But that's what I had to resort to, uh, even though they did look like the tiniest of ants from where I was sitting, mm -hmm. I would have liked to have seen the stage, you know, oh, to get the full, you know. Uh, my experience was not nearly as bad as yours, but I was all the way at the back where most of the time I watched what was on the screen. I mean, I could see Paul, I could see the band, but they were, you know, like ants for me. You were on the upper level? Yeah. Um, but I will say that that particular show, the crowd was electric and a lot of it had to do with the fact that it was the last show of that leg mm -hmm. um, and the last show before he was about to turn 80. And, you know, there was a lot of buzz that maybe Ringo was going to show up and we didn't know what special guests might show up. But I think most Beatle fans were kind of hoping Ringo would be there. And I was not expecting Bruce Springsteen to show up. As See, he and I heard Bruce. I he heard did. Bruce Ringo, Bruce Ringo, Bruce Ringo. OK. You know, I didn't hear somebody going Bruce Ringo, Bruce Ringo, Bruce Ringo like that. But uh, I had been hearing it was going to be the two of them. Yeah. Um, coming out. So, uh, yeah, it's it's unfortunate. I mean, some people will let, you know, won't let, wouldn't let things like this bug them. You know, when you're seeing this concert in a stadium, a lot of times it's not so much to see the concert, it's to experience the event. Uh, but it just went, you know, I had, no, I had these great seats that I thought, all right, they're going to be far away. I don't care about that long as I could sit, because I can't stand for long periods of time, mm -hmm. uh, as long as I could sit and there's nobody like really in front of me come passing back and forth, this is going to be great. Uh -huh. And then they put the damn monitor up uh, in, in, my, in my view. And somebody on the opposite end, you know, had this pro probably had the same problem with the monitors that were on the left of the soundboard. But um, anyway... Uh, to the show itself. So uh, dig in, Ken, let her rip. I thought the show was fantastic. I thought that the mix of the show was pretty good. Um, comparing it to the show at Fenway, which I thought was very muddy sounding. Um, like I said, the crowd was really into this. They were pumped. There are certain songs where they were singing along. And on the one hand, I love the fact that they're that involved with the songs like Hey Jude, they're all singing Hey Jude, they're all singing Oh Blah Dee Oh Blah Da, but I want to hear Paul sing and I'm not getting to hear him sing because the crowd's drowning him out. But even still, that's part of the excitement of the whole thing. And it is, it is part concert, it is part event. Um, I try to really zero in on the concert and the performance of the band and listening to Paul. Sometimes Paul's vocals are drowned out. Sometimes you can hear him very well. And, um, but I do think that the band is just so tight. Mm -hmm. They really performed extremely well. And, um, you know, part of the, of the thrill for me is watching people in the crowd and their reaction, seeing, you know, the wide spectrum of fans from teenagers to grandparents. Sometimes families are all together and you can tell certain people are seeing Paul for the first time, as hard as that is to believe. Some of them are shocked to see the explosions and the fireworks for Live and Let Die. I want to look at them and say, where you been? been doing this since 1976. <laughs> you know? And, um, you know, I was just happy to be there and and like it's been said so many times, the fact that he's he was almost 80, pulling this off and doing a near three-hour show, I will tell you that um, a couple of things surprised me. When Springsteen performed, he did Glory Days. Now, this is something that never happens at a Paul McCartney concert. If you have a guest come on, they don't do their songs. They do Paul songs. Billy Joel comes to a Paul McCartney concert, it's either going to be, I saw her standing there, I think it was, or let it be. Um, 
but it's not a Billy Joel song. So it was really cool Thanks. that Springsteen did Glory Days and Paul is there playing the bass to it, singing along with it. You don't see that enough. I wish Paul would support the other artists that join him on stage with their songs. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really unique. And then they did I Want to Be Your Man, which was cool. Um, John Bon Jovi also showed up, but he just went out there to lead the crowd into singing Happy Birthday mm -hmm. to Paul. He brought up balloons for Paul yep. to celebrate, and that was nice. But, um, you know, we were all questioning about Ringo. And uh, we just figured that since he didn't show up, it must be because he was in quarantine because of the situation with, with his band. You know, since Paul showed up for Ringo's 70th, we figured that Ringo would be there for Paul's 80th. Yeah. But um, yeah, I, I have a feeling he would have been there um, if he didn't have that situation with his band. Mm -hmm. But the performances were, were really fine. And I think that his vocals are improving a little bit, not drastically, you know, a little bit better because he's resting himself in between shows. Most concerts are every other night, although, you know, he did two shows at Fenway, two nights in a row. Um, and I'm just happy to be there. I'm happy that he's sharing his time with us. He doesn't have to do this. And time is precious when you're, you know, at that advanced age. So I was really thrilled to be there. And um, he did say during the concert, this is the last show of our U.S. tour. And when he said that, that made me think, oh, is he planning Europe next or something yeah, like that? Yeah, so yeah. I paid careful attention to that. I, I thought that was like a, a sign that this is going to continue after Glastonbury. Yeah, somewhere along the lines, and I may be incorrect about this, I, I could have sworn, I thought I saw something where it was referred to as, as, as you know, just a portion of a bigger tour. Um, I could be wrong, but... I heard him, I mentioned that as well. And I thought, all right, well, you know, he's not going to do this type tour and not hit Europe, at least. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So whether or not it's in 2022 or next year, again, like I said earlier on, uh, uh, that, will, that will find out. You know, I'm listening to you, Ken, and I'm thinking to myself, I probably did let, um, I probably did let, uh, you know, the, the seats and the obscured, um, not obscured, the um, obstructed view seats kind of take away a little bit from me. But I don't know. I just sensed watching him on the screen. He seemed slightly slower, slightly older. There wasn't a bounce in his step as he navigated the stage. And I was like, you know, I'm probably reading too much into what I'm seeing. It's probably me being uh, a crab. <laughs> um, it seemed like the, see, I thought the energy level was a little low early on. Uh, it didn't help that I was at, I'm 57. I was a kid compared to the age of the people sitting around me. <laughs> um, so that whole section was like uh, snoring. I heard they were like, it was not a lot of activity in the section I was sitting in. It seemed like McCartney too, is the, just the energy level picked up as you approached midway of the show. And I mentioned this before we started recording, it seemed like McCartney's voice was getting better and stronger as the show went along. Even my daughter pointed out to me, he actually sounds towards the end. He sounds really good now. Earlier on, there were those moments with, uh, with got to get you into my life with maybe I'm amazed where, you know, you cringe a little bit because they, the weak, his weak voice comes through. But there weren't as many of those moments as I was anticipating. Uh, he did, you could tell how he was trying to just trying to back off the mic a little, trying not maybe to sing as powerfully um, on certain songs. And it was working. And, and I thought, you know what? Everyone's complaining about the set list. It's the same old, same old, same old, same old Paul. I felt like the set list was kind of digging deep fairly often early on in the show. I have, and I, I have it here. Yeah. Uh, I feel like I got the Ten Commandments here. Um, the um, early on in the show, I mean, you're starting, of course, with Can't Buy Me Love, Can't Miss, right down the middle Beatles song. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Junior's Farm, Letting Go, older Wings tunes don't have the clout that some of the old classic Beatles songs have, um, especially they, not they Letting Go. Sounded, they sound wow. fantastic. They did. Oh, oh, no, it did. Yeah, I uh, will tell you, Letting Go was a big highlight for me. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's a song that really works well live. And so does Junior's Farm. But with the horns and everything for Letting Go, it was fantastic. Uh, but then, you know, Beatles song, then Come On To Me, and uh, Let Him In was a bit of a surprise. It seemed as though there was some digging deep here and there, which for some reason that night caught my ear. And I'm like, it's nice to hear him, you know, mixing in Dance Tonight and hearing New. Uh, I'd really, I've never been much of a For You fan, although it wasn't bad, uh, the performance. I would have maybe liked to have heard something from McCartney 3 in its place. Uh, mm -hmm. But he was doing, you know, he was digging in there and uh, doing some tracks that the hardcore fans would appreciate. And I'm sure the, the casual fan was like, what's this? Uh, Paul didn't really elaborate much on uh, this is from this album. This is from that album. He did make his usual joke about, you know, we're going to do something that we want to do now because it's our show, you know, and he went into one of the newer tunes. Um, and then he really, uh, really kicks it in, of course, later on. Um, doing Being for the Benefit of Mr. Kite was a pleasant uh, surprise, a John Lennon song. It was nice to hear that. Uh, like I said, Let Him In uh, was, was, a, was a pleasant surprise. Um, and all, all in all, I mean, one, once I got over my crut over the seats and the obstructed view, everything took, took a little time, but, uh, as the show was going along, I was zoned in. It seemed like maybe it was because I was in a better mood. Paul was feeding off me and, uh, it seemed like his energy level picked up just a touch. Uh, and. And then out comes Bruce Springsteen, who was, who was glowing. He was so excited. Mm -hmm. uh, and Glory Days was a treat. Uh, and I Want to Be Your Man. I mean, there was genuine joy you could uh, coming off of Bruce that he was up there doing that. Um, and when all was said and done, I thought to myself, you know what? This was one heck of a McCartney concert. You know, I maybe went into the whole thing when they announced it, like, I don't know if I want Paul to be performing live anymore. What's his voice going to sound like? Blah, 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 blah. And when all was said and done, I said, he pulled it off. You know, there was a couple of rough patches here and there, but they don't like, they don't have uh, bells and whistles on them. They just, they come and go, you know, the weak spots in the voice or something like that. Like you said, the band was dead on. Um, and uh, he, he pulls it off. He's 80 years old. He pulled it off and he played because the show was longer than previous shows on the tour because Bruce comes out and does two songs right there. Uh, when he was all done, it was a three hour show at MetLife stadium. Yeah. Uh, probably the end was maybe a little longer because Bruce joined them and was playing uh, guitar with the band. Uh, so all told three hour show from Paul McCartney, 48 hours before, before he turned 80. Um, can so, I comment on what you were saying? <laughs> what was that? Can I comment on what yeah. you were saying? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, I haven't checked, but I'm pretty sure that the set list of what he's been doing is almost identical to what he was doing before COVID. So, um, and from my standpoint, and, and I'm surprised that I'm saying this because you know that as someone who really appreciates his entire catalog, I wish he wouldn't go so heavy on the Beatles. But when I listened the first time all the way through, this is at Fenway, I didn't feel like it was so Beatle heavy, you know, because there were a lot of songs in there to, to play Junior's Farm and Letting Go back to back, two wing songs, which was, you know, a big highlight for me. Yeah. And to still acknowledge Egypt Station with Come On To Me and For You and to play the title track to New and mix that with, you know, Wings Classics, Band on the Run, and, and uh, Live and Let Die, and then also maybe I'm Amazed in there. It didn't feel like it was, you know, mainly a Beatles concert, even though there's more Beatles songs than there is solo. But um, 
I also happen to feel, this is my personal observance. I think he sounded really good on the newer songs vocally. Yeah, I, I agree. Fantastic on Come On To Me and For You. I really think For You is a really good song as a live song. Yeah, I agree. Um, and new, he sounded fantastic. So, um, yeah, and by the way, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, which he has been doing for many years now, it's probably since I'm going to guess like 2015. He was talking about the song that he and John helped to pull the words off the circus poster mm -hmm. that he helped to write the song. He never said it was a 50 50, but I think part of the reason why he does being for the benefit of Mr. Kite is because he was a co-writer on it. You know? Yeah, I knew he was, I knew he's, you know, he's performed it in the past. Same with Let Him In. Uh, maybe those are just two songs that he hasn't done as much. And I I've tended to forget that I've seen him do it in the past years ago. And they hearing them still kind of, oh, it's kind of a surprise. Uh, you're not expecting uh, these tunes, which you've heard before, but still uh, you're not, 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 ones that come immediately to mind when you're trying off the top of your head to tell folks well he'll do this he'll do this song he'll do that song you know I'll, i would completely have forgotten being for the benefit of mr kite for some reason i remember clearer and it's a long time now him doing fixing a hole not being for the benefit of mr kite so it was a treat you know and let him in just seems like one of those great classic 70s wings hits that just gets lost amongst this massive catalog mm. that he has. And listen to what the man said would be another. Uh, he didn't perform that, but that's another one that I, I feel tends to, and it was a number one. I always feel that that's a song that tends to slip between the cushions. Um, he did listen to what the man said before COVID. I don't know if it was the, the exact tour right before it, but fairly close in time. He brought it back. But... Um, Overall, it's kind of like, it's very tough for me to be critical of someone who doesn't have to do this mm -hmm. and is spending his time with us. And I still think that his, his voice sounds a little bit better than the last yeah. time. In a nutshell, to make a blanket statement, I'd agree with you. I'd, you know, you read some of the things on Facebook leading into this tour and, you know, you were expecting, you know, uh, uh, Scatman Crothers to come out and sing, <laughs> you know, uh, and it was nothing like that. And in fact, I'd even say that there were parts of the show where he sounded better than I remember him the last time I saw him. Um, now, before we throw it to Alan, Alan um, was able, and he wasn't there in person, but Alan really devoured the Glastonbury performance, which I followed. saw your concert too. I saw your concert on an HD recording from the second row. I didn't have to, you know, deal with people around me snoring or. Wait a minute. Uh, that might have been that monitor might have been set up for you. That was blocking my view of the stage. <laughs> now, um, my, my guy was apparently in like the second row. So you could see some monitor stuff sometimes if he decided to shoot that. But since he was so close to the stage, there wasn't really much point. Um, I decided to sit this tour out. Um, partly because, I mean, you know, now I live in Maine, it's kind of, I haven't figured out like how to, uh, you know, like all the places I used to go, Sea Paul almost, were local. Um, and here, the closest thing is that, you know, so, some Little League park in Massachusetts or something. And he said, I don't go there. I've seen him at Yankee Stadium, a real stadium. So <clears throat> oh, anyway, the thing is, I mean, I've, I've, I've seen him so many times in so many different places. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of actually secretly the Glenn Gould of concert goers. I don't know if you, Glenn Gould was a, a pianist who decided after a while that he didn't want to play concerts anymore. He just wanted to make records. Um, and, you know, there's, there's, there's something, there's a lot to be said. I mean, if, if I had never seen Paul, you know, 50 times, um, I might've, tried really hard to get to Boston to, to see this. Um, but I think for me, um, simply being in the same rough, you know, breathing space as a person performing 
doesn't matter that much to me so long as I can see and hear the performance one way or another, which these days is going to happen. You know, I mean, I have almost all the concerts on this leg of the tour on video. Um, they're out there. Some of them are not great shots. You know, some of them are from sitting, you know, much further back than you guys were. And so are mostly the screens. Um, but, you know, you get an idea of what the set is. And um, I just um, I just didn't. um want to do it this time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and there's also still the COVID thing, you know, I, I'm, it's not like I'm a snowflake about it, but I don't really, really feel a great desire to be in, a, you know, a place with 20,000 other people. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I, I saw your show and I saw, obviously, Glastonbury we're going to talk about. Yeah. Um, the one thing I haven't been able to get, and if anybody has managed to um, come up with a copy and wants to send me an email, we can work something out. Um, the show in uh, the, the, the pre-show for Glastonbury, the one in From, um, there were only 800 people in there. So the odds that someone was going to get a video of that concert were fairly low because they were um, apparently pretty strict about, um, you know, uh, electronic stuff coming in. Mm -hmm. um, in 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 McCartney shows I've been to in the past, they've also said that they were strict about stuff like that. But you know, you take your mic apart and put it in your shoe, and you put your recorder down your pants, and you you, know, you do the whole thing, assemble it all in the men's room, and you can. Um, you can, you can accidentally tape some of those concerts yourself as, as I may, may very well have done. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, the High Line, <laughs> the <laughs> High Line, I'm standing there with you know, my two recorders and Paul's on stage saying, I know some of you guys are out there taping this. <laughs> it was great. Anyway. <clears throat> I would definitely have had all kinds of technical problems with recorders down my pants and stuff like that. Um, <laughs> Well, I, did, keep them there. <laughs> I did. Uh, I do have a little footage that I shot that I didn't tell you guys. Um, there's no audio, though, but a footage of, of, of the show from my vantage point. Ah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe I'll have to, maybe I should send you my copy of your show. <laughs> you this is what it looked like to me. It. Apple. Um, <laughs> no, it was more like more more like like this. Yeah. Uh, wow. Anyway, um, very quickly, kind of minor points about non musical, non concert things. Um, I'm a merch guy. Mm. Okay. There's I don't that. know. I think they had one merch table at MetLife Stadium. I did not see anything. Uh, walking in, I saw one outside the stadium. Inside the concourses, none. Um, I don't know if I wasn't looking hard enough or not walking long enough. Uh, and then after the show was over, completely cleaned out of everything. So I had to drop a small fortune, not that bad, really, uh, to get the program because I couldn't even get a program. Um, and it looks like a really nice, I haven't thumbed through it yet. It just came in the mail. Uh, but I had to buy it from somebody on eBay. I'm always afraid when I do that that I got somebody's like Xerox copy of the program that I've just bought. Um, and the t-shirts, they were pretty much cleaned out. And even if you went online, uh, even till now, um, swag is, is minimal of what's still out there. Um, but just while, while I'm complaining about things that like, you know, annoyed me that had nothing to do with the music. Um, now we swing over, let's swing over to Glastonbury. Um, which was sort of the um, kind of a one-off, wasn't technically part of the leg that ended in Jersey. Um, he's played Glastonbury before, but I think that, you know, around the coming out of his first show as an 80-year-old, uh, there was quite a bit of buzz. Um, I thought it was also interesting that see, Paul headlined the second of the three nights, and I believe the headliner on the third of the three nights, Glastonbury, was was uh, was Diana Ross, if I'm not mistaken, or at least she was right up there. So it was kind of nice to see the uh, the old timers, you know, kind of taking over 
Glastonbury. But anyway, Alan has seen uh, uh, the footage. We've seen bits of it, Ken and I. Alan's seen the whole thing, and he's seen, well, he's seen every show now we know. Uh, uh, if you, Alan, compa- compare uh, the two shows, quality of uh, the performance, quality of Paul's voice, et cetera, anything comes to mind immediately that maybe Glastonbury was superior or inferior? They were really close because, you know, there may have been a little more excitement about the Glastonbury show, but, but the, the one in New Jersey, because it was the last night of the tour and he had Springsteen there. And I, I think the fact that it was the last night of the tour, um, you know, made that particularly exci- exciting too. <clears throat> but with Glastonbury, I mean, you had, uh, you know, first of all, the fact that it's Glastonbury, I mean, and that's a big deal. The fact that he was, you know, they were making something about um, him being the oldest performer ever to play there. And I think the previous night, Billy Eilish played and was the youngest performer ever to be there. Um, and the fact that Glastonbury had been canceled during COVID. And so this is the first one back. Um, <clears throat> it, it kind of made that. I think particularly exciting. Um, and if, if between the two of them, I would say the Glastonbury one has an edge. Um, by the way, the show is available on the BBC iPlayer. Um, if you Google it, uh, you know, Paul McCartney, Glastonbury, BBC iPlayer, you'll find it. And, um, you know, it's definitely worth watching. Um, I is watched. It complete? Is it complete or is there any? uh... Ah, Yeah, it's complete. Now, apparently the BBC broadcast of it, which was the first version I got, (laughs) didn't have in spite of all the danger for some reason. I mean, if you sort of think, okay, if they had to cut something for time, but cutting that, you know, cut like less than five minutes out of the show. I mean, that one was still two hours and four. 42 minutes or something like that. But the one on the iPlayer is complete with In Spite of All the Danger. Uh, So, you know, that's the one to look for. And uh, there are ways to download it. I don't know if it's officially downloadable, but, you know, there's always a way. Uh, So, you know, it's, you know, not to mention, I mean, the the other thing, I mean, as a watching experience, as good as the HD version of uh, MetLife was, uh, you know, that was one camera. You know, this is quite a few cameras, quite a few angles, and it's in stereo. It might have even been in surround. I haven't, uh, I haven't listened to see if that's the case, but, but the stereo was great. Um, and, you know, fantastic sound. I pretty much agree with you guys about his vocals. Uh, There were a few places, I mean, maybe I'm amazed is something that for quite some time has been tough for him. Um, There were a couple of moments in Get Back maybe where, you know, but, you know, at, at this point you sort of stop even hearing those problems. The fact that, you know, this guy is 80 years old. He's doing a nearly three hour show. He was, um, he had plenty of energy on the stage. Um, and also, you know, I've noticed this, I've, I've noticed this when, like when I saw him at Yankee stadium and I've watched a few times since then. I mean, it's possible that it, it's, you know, either when I wasn't looking or when the camera wasn't looking, but you don't even see the guy take a drink. Yeah. You know, I mean, and I don't even understand how that's possible. He took yeah. a sip of water at Giant Stadium. And actually, somebody had seen the show, I think, in Baltimore mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and messaged me. He actually took a sip of water. Yeah. It seemed as though um a stagehand ran out like a water bottle hmm. you know and it wasn't even like leave it out here i want more yeah you know it was just like here you know he took his like his a, a, his little sip and that was it but that was a first mm-hmm. um and that is something that amazes me that he that he doesn't do that because i can't do a podcast without my water yeah i could um, swear the glastonbury show i saw somebody bring out some water for him did you 
And like you said, he took a sip and that was it. Yeah, that was it. That's like, yeah. And, and there may have been some others. as well. The camera wasn't on him or something, but, um, but still that's, you know, it's not a lot on a three hour show. Um, I did notice a couple of things like, um, in some cases, the vocals seemed a little bit lower in the mix. Uh, and the other thing was um, Camp Bomb Me Love. The opening of Camp Bomb Me Love had everyone singing. Now, he sang the verses on his own. Um, but I wonder whether that was, you know, just so that, like, there was plenty of support on that very first thing you hear vocally. Uh, right. The rest of the song, I mean, he didn't really have any problems singing it. Um so, yeah, I thought is, you know, his, his, not to dwell on his voice, you know, I thought it was, I, I thought, you know, the, the problems we've heard in the past, you know, there, a lot of them are there, um, but a lot of them, you know, for a, quite a long stretch of the concert, I don't remember even really noticing, you know, they're his songs, he sings them, you know, they're, the band plays great. Uh, the other thing uh, about this show was um, Bruce and uh, and Dave Grohl uh, when they played on the end. Um, that was, I thought, you know, significantly longer than it usually is. And also the way it usually is, is, you know, pretty much the solos on the record. I mean, they have a little bit of freedom, but, um, you know, you know how it's going to go and it goes that way. But with these two extra guys, you had more of a jam. You know, and you also had Paul directing, you know, okay, you, mm -hmm. you, you know, mm -hmm. and um, not sure how rehearsed that was or whether they knew, you know, what they were going to play when he pointed to, you know, or, you know, whether it was going to be their turn. Um, you know, they, I thought, did really well. It made it, it made it exciting hearing it, you know, with extra stuff that, we haven't heard before, you know, it, it just was uh, it's sort of like value added in a way. I'm not completely crazy about the version of um, you never give me your money and going into she came in through the bathroom window. Right. Um, just because it's, you know, it's sort of like comes in in the middle. It's not complete. I mean, she came in through the bathroom window is fine. You know, I, I'm happy to hear it. Um, but, uh, that sort of truncated, yeah. never give me your money to, doesn't really work for me, but that was the one dud I'd say, even though the song sounded okay, mm -hmm. but putting them together like that was kind of weird. You should have just done, she came in through the bathroom window, uh, like Joe Cocker did it as a song, you <laughs> know, um, not singing it like Joe Cocker. Well, uh, <laughs> um, but that was like the one thing that I also, I agree um that was the one of the set lists but he gets a pass on that yeah yeah i think that the way he started it was really jarring yeah mm -hmm. you no know, it just didn't make much sense to me i don't know why he chose to do it that way yeah um after you've heard it at a few shows it, it you begin to you know okay you know you you now expect it and all that but it i i i I hope he doesn't retain that. Um, it's interesting that he was experimenting with it. Um, I would say that was an experiment that didn't really totally work. Right. Mm. So I'd agree. And I also would have liked to have heard something from McCartney three. I've got to say, I mean, there were things from new, there were things from Egypt station. McCartney three is his most recent album. Um, aren't people supposed to play stuff from their most e recent album usually? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, not only really that, but Women and Wives, which he was doing at the start of the tour, I would not think that that would be a song he'd pick. You no. got to think about a song that would work really well, especially in a stadium surrounding. And that's a piano song. That's a quiet song. Mm -hmm. It's one thing when you're doing a, a ballad or a quiet song that everybody knows. You right. know, you can get away with doing Yesterday or doing Blackbird or something like that, an acoustic song, because everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. But you know, women and wives is not the right choice. Find my way would have been perfect. Right. Yeah. If I pick one song. I, I would have picked that. Yeah. Yeah. There were, there were several that would have worked really well. And, um, uh, but you know, okay. I mean, it was what it was. Uh, and there was, I don't know if you saw this on the, on the internet, there was, uh, 
uh, people complaining about the set list. And I think it was Pierce Morgan um, came out and said, you know, for God's sakes, you know, he did nine of the most incredible songs ever written in the 20th century, you know, and he named nine songs, uh, you know, plus everything else, you know, shut up. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. I could see that. Yeah. I mean, you know, look, it's our 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 job to uh, comment, and you know, you have to come up with you know what you thought was a good idea and what was a bad idea. But um, you know, a, as a whole, uh, I <laughs> I'll watch the Glass and Berry show again. I I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah. yeah. Um, All right. Can I comment on Glass and Berry because I've seen about half of it. The mm-hmm. one thing that I'd like to point out is that when you watch this, you can really hear the mix extremely well. So you can hear Paul's vocals, whether it's low in the mix or whether it's right up front. So you really have a a good judge. You can be a good judge of how his vocals were throughout the whole show. And um, it's one thing that I've learned here is that you cannot pin him down and say, you know, his vocals are horrible throughout the whole show or something. There are times when he struggles, but then he'll come right back and surprise you. And especially at Glastonbury, I watched, maybe I'm amazed. And he was really shaky at the very beginning, but then his voice got really strong the rest of the, of the song. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like what you were saying, Darren, you know, as the show went on, his voice got stronger. I've noticed that with his shows in the past, that he could be struggling at the very beginning. And all of a sudden, for some reason, it gets better as the show progresses. I don't know why that is. You would think it would get weaker. Yeah. Yeah. I do think that being for the benefit of Mr. Kite, since you brought that up, doesn't work that well as a live song. I mean, I love the song. Don't yeah. get me wrong. But, you know, I can I can name other songs that he could do if you want other Beatles songs that would work much better than that one. But, um, yeah. Uh, I did, it really it was, was, to me, it was like, even though I had I'd seen him um, even though I've seen him do the song before, he doesn't do it enough that when he did do it at John, at, uh, at MetLife Stadium, it was an oh, a little bit of an oh wow moment for me. You know, I forgot, oh, I forgot he, yeah, okay, this is fun. It's, I think of it as a John song naturally because John sang it, hmm. you know, and I looked at it being as maybe a little bit of a nod to John to do that one. Um, even though, like you said, he, he probably had more of a hand at writing it than than we than we think. But hmm. um, and getting better, by the way, I thought his voice. Yeah, was glass yeah. and mm-hmm. he, he he finds a way to know how to control his voice. Yeah, you know he doesn't push it too much when he knows he can't do that, and he's hitting just the right notes. It may not be overpowering what he's doing with his vocals, but he's hitting the right notes, and he's he's sounding good. Right. I think it's a better judge when you when you can hear everything in the mix than if you're, you know, in the stadium all the way back and you can't hear the full mix. And sometimes no. it gets drowned up. You also can't go by like somebody's home, you home video shot on their phone right. on YouTube where everything sounds bad for some reason. Um. All right, so uh, those are our thoughts on the Got Back Tour, the uh, North American leg now in the books. Paul's 80th birthday now behind us and his performance at Glastonbury and maybe later in the year, we'll be talking about uh, more Got Back dates. Um, We had mentioned, I had mentioned at the beginning of the show, uh, talking Ringo. I think what we'll do is hold Ringo, hold him tightly. Uh, We'll hold Ringo for our next show uh, his birthday is still coming, uh, and maybe in the next show we'll spend a few extra minutes talking a bit about Ringo, who will be 82 when we gather uh, for the next things we said today. Because now we uh, had decided that uh, we were going to share with you uh, our little personal lists on our favorite deep slash obscure Paul McCartney songs that are favorites to us. I'm sure most of you out there know all these songs. There might be a couple of you out there that are not familiar with them, but uh, I know in my in my case, I don't think I picked anything that 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 uh, would be a mystery. But I did try to dig as deep as I 
could and come up with a breadth of, of songs from through the years. Um, so let's go around to Robin and uh, talk about, pick our five deep cuts from McCartney. We'll start with uh, Alan. Okay. Um, first one I picked, probably everyone will groan. In fact, two of them, everyone's going to groan. Prina Karore from oh. the McCartney album. <laughs> Yay. I'm kidding. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's really an outlier. It's a track that probably everyone, you know, skips. Um, really, the album should have ended with Maybe I'm Amazed. I mean, you want to end with a really strong song. <laughs> That's the one. Um, Karina Crore, you know, you sort of wonder what it's doing stuck on the end there. But I, I, it's a track I kind of like because, um, you know, I've seen the, the film that inspired it, which was The Tribe That Hides From Man, I think, uh, something like that. It was, it was about a uh, a group of Brazilian Indians called Krina, the Krina Crore. Uh, and they're very non-social, like no one had been able to contact them, have any exchanges with them. Um, if they catch you, they kill you. Um, and this uh, film crew um, enlisted some of the uh, friendlier tribes that also hadn't really been in contact with them, but, you know, spoke a language that was closer to theirs and, you know, got them a little closer. But they, by the end of the film, they still hadn't really made contact. Uh, anyway, so Paul saw this, this film. Uh, he, had, he had gone home from um, some recording sessions Will for McCartney when he was now doing it at, uh, you know, in actual studios, it wasn't all done in his house, um, came home, he was going to watch a boxing match. The boxing match was over in like half an hour. And so he switched over and caught this thing. Um, and he decided that he wanted to do some sort of a tribute to the Karina Crore or to the film in general, or, you know, it, it, it just was sort of inspired by that. And, and he had some instrumental ideas and took them into the studio and uh you know they they i think they <laughs> built a fire in the middle of the studio to record that um he went out and bought a bow and arrow and they set up mics across the studio so that he could shoot the bow and arrow and record the arrow going past um you know he really he really made some effort on this track and it's an interesting instrumental track that i think doesn't get enough attention um and so that's why i chose that one i uh, wish there was a film that was made of him in the studio working on this yeah yeah that would have been right. that yeah. would have been cool yeah. shoot a little to the left and, and <laughs> knock out a thousand dollar mic that's right. <laughs> right you know I and mean, hey you know for the next album he brought in a gun <laughs> yeah for, uh, a woman oh why um <clears throat> which ended up as a piece i but still, it was during the, the, the Ram sessions. Um, so the next one, I might as well do the other one that will elicit groans. And that is Loop <laughs> from well, Red Why, Red why are you saying that? I love these tracks. Really? Well, um, I know a lot of people don't. I know, I know a lot of people think that they're just sort of self-indulgent, uh, you know, instrumental. You know, people, people don't appreciate his instrumentals, for one thing. You know, they want to hear him sing. They want to hear a song. Uh, you know, it's pop, but a lot of what I listen to isn't songs and isn't pop and is instrumental. And so to me, these are, are pretty normal things. And Loop was experimental, as Karina Crory was too. Um, Linda had just gotten a mini Moog and uh, brought it into the studio and they were, you know, getting different sounds on it. And they just sort of, you know, found some sounds they liked and ended up sort of doing a little jam and adding multi-tracking and, and, and finally um, what they came up with was this loop, the first Indian on the moon. Um, who knows what that's supposed to mean or why it's called that. Um, 
but it's it's a great little sort of spacey fantasy track. You can see the moon part, uh, and and there are I think some uh, percussion things that may may have contributed the you know Indian part, um, but uh, I yeah. like loop a lot. Do you? Really oh, good. I love Loop. I did not like it like years and years and years ago. It grew on me because mm -hmm. it's, it's a great funky bass line he's playing on it. Mm -hmm. Danny Sywell's got a, a, a pretty cool beat mm -hmm. on it. Uh, I, I like Loop a lot. Mm -hmm. so I'm happy you picked it. I groaned because, well, I just thought I'd supply some sound effects. <laughs> okay. I'm glad you picked those two tracks because for everyone that complains that Paul is Mr. Pop, Mr. Top 40, you know, Mr. Commercial, here he is doing something more experimental. Yeah. And certainly in the case of Karina Crory, that sounds very improvisational to me, like what he's thinking in his head at that moment. Yeah. Not something that's all planned out. So mm -hmm. I, I find that particular track really interesting. And I love Loop too, mm -hmm. as well. You really think about it. It was kind of ballsy. I mean, the McCartney album in general, to me, was a ballsy album to make. And I'm sure we've talked about this in the past. Mm. Uh, coming off Abbey Road, coming off the Beatles, probably feeling like he's got to prove himself uh, as an individual artist. Mm -hmm. uh, for him to deliver an album like McCartney, which was so anti-Abbey Road mm -hmm. and was so... It wasn't a safe right down the middle album. And then you wrap it with Karina Crore. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I would, again, I, I'd say this all the time on this show. I would love to have gone back. Either me buying McCartney when it was brand new in April 70 and listening to it for the first time and getting, uh, you know, my first impression of it. Um, because it was really, really a cutting edge and ballsy move to do a record like that coming out of the Beatles. But a lot of fans didn't think that way when they no. were, they no, were but... bewildered, a lot of them. Hey, you know what he should do? <laughs> Instead of putting out McCartney one, two, three in a package yet again, um, where everyone who can be expected to buy that set already has all three albums. I mean, I, I'd be very surprised if there were 10 buyers of that set who didn't own those albums already. What he should do is, you know, he must have you know, his archives. Um, this is a guy who is recording all the time, demos, experiments, you name it. He must have a ton of things like Karina Crore and Loop that he's done just for himself that he likes, that are experimental, that were just fun to do, um, that didn't make it onto McCartney 2 or, you know, anything else. And he should just do, you know, he wanted to put out a three record set, put out three records of that, put out three records of that, that we haven't heard before and is going to show us a totally different side of you. Um, Call it McCartney 0.5. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but also, you know, from 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 his whole career, you know, uh, and, and we've heard bits of them. I mean, he put bits in Ubu Jubu and, uh, you know, we know what he did on McCartney, too. It was a bunch of that. And, you know, so so we know that that stuff exists. And um, I, I, I really think it could be kind of an interesting, interesting thing to do. But I also have that idea about the Beatles, too. I think they should take Carnival of Light and there is a, a percussion piece that they did and uh, put that together with Revolution 9 and, you know, just put out the Beatles do avant-garde, you know. Um, anyway, I should get back to uh, the list, right? Because you guys have to yep. do yours, too. The third one, back to normal songs, so to speak, is I Lie Around. Um, it's kind of an odd one. It's, you know, <laughs> excuse me, a Paul composition, but Denny's singing it or Denny's singing most of it. Um, you know, I think that uh, Elvisy uh, all over the place, I think is Paul. Um, but yeah. um, it, 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 it sounds uh, it sounds to me like it's inspired by, if anything, uh, the Bonzo Dog Band or the Bonzo Dog Doodah Band. To me, 
I lie around and especially that all over the place thing just reminds me of, uh, you know, the Bonzo track in Magical Mystery Tour. I don't know Death why. Cat for Cutie. Yeah, Death Cat for Cutie. Um, but also, you know, it kind of it kind of is a nice, relaxed, almost countryish tune, you know, and, you know, therefore in the country, I'll lay my burden down. It's uh, I like it. You know, there's also that little little audio uh, uh piece that they put at the beginning of someone, you know, diving into a lake or, you know, mm -hmm. sort of outside family kind of sounds. Um, it's just a song that I think um, hardly anyone bothers listening to. You never hear it on the radio. Uh, and it's just something I thought would be good to call attention to. It, it's it's uh, most of it is an outtake from Ram. Of course, Denny wasn't there for Ram. I'd love to hear it with the original Paul vocal. That would be nice. Um, but, you know, then it ended up on Red Rose Speedway uh, with Denny's vocal. Well, did, it didn't even end up on Red Rose Speedway. It ended up on what would have been the double LP. Yeah, right. Um, but I think it was um, it was considered for the double album, right? Is it on the version of the double album they put out? in the last archival reissue, I think maybe. Um, I'll look it up. I'll yeah. Look it up. Yeah. Um, so, you know, here was a track that he rejected twice before putting it on the B-side. <laughs> yeah, it was, in, it was in the original double album version. It was listed here. Yeah. Yeah. I lie around. So that's one, two, three. Uh, my fourth one is Winter Rose, Love Awake. Okay. Um, I'm a sucker for a harpsichord <laughs> and that's got one. Um, but it's a very sort of pretty tune in a very kind of 17th century British style. You know, um, it sounds to me almost the sum of it um, um, the, uh, of the winter rose part anyway, like something steel I span could have done, you know, and, right. and, and, I really like that kind of stuff. And Love Awake, when it you know, goes into Love Awake, it's a nice, catchy kind of tune. Um, I like the Winter Rose part better, but the whole thing, I think, works together really well. Um, another one of his patented take two songs and make them into a song right. kind of deal. Mm -hmm. And finally, Flying to My Home, the B-side of nice. <laughs> My Brave Face. Um, when that came out, uh, you know, I listened to that and I thought, why is this not on Flowers in the Dirt? This is fantastic. Or actually, when it came out, Flowers in the Dirt wasn't out yet. But it was, I think, clear that that was going to be a non-LPB side. Mm -hmm. um, and then Flowers in the Dirt came out, wasn't on it, seemed to me like it should have been. Um, and then I think uh, a few months after Flowers in the Dirt came out, the Japanese version came out with a whole extra disc worth of B-sides and all kinds of stuff. So it was on that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful track and, uh, you know, again, because it's a B side, um, I don't think gets enough attention. So that's my five. Okay. Oh, By the way, Alan, huh. I play, I lie around on my radio show. Well, Ken, <laughs> you got to listen to every little thing. I'm telling okay. you. Okay. Okay. I'll put it in my. No, I don't. I don't actually listen to the radio that much. But um, what I find, I listen to. You know, if I'm in a grocery store, so, I mean, I've been in grocery stores up here in Portland, and another day has come on. You mm -hmm. know, or just some, you know, Wings track or whatever. And I always sort of think, well, that, that's great. They're playing that. You know, it's cool. So I um, hear I hear lesser known McCartney songs in the supermarket mm -hmm. than I do on the radio. Yeah. Like put my it supermarket there. doesn't play music. A common one for me. Hmm. What's that? My supermarket doesn't play music. Ken, <laughs> you have a list for yes. us? Okay. I, I was able I was to manage to come up with five, I think. And actually, uh, I want to start by saying that like you, Alan, I also included Flying to My Home. Because <laughs> I think it is a great B-side. What I think is especially cool about it is the intro of it with Paul's a cappella vocals going into the song. Mm -hmm. It has a very Ram-like quality to that. There's a quirkiness to the song where I think it could have fit on Ram very well. 
I love flying to my home. I wish I would have picked it. I would have picked it if I thought of it. It was one that slipped through the cracks on me. So kudos to the two of you for picking flying to my home. Yeah. Now, one that I kind of expected all three of us to mention because we brought it up fairly recently is Little Lamb Dragonfly, which I think is uh, without question a masterpiece. We keep bringing up Ram because originally Little Lamb Dragonfly was done during the sessions of Ram. And it was originally really planned for the Rupert the Bear right. uh, full-length feature film. But Paul has this knack of writing a lot of separate songs that he strings together. And in this particular case, it all sounds like he could have written it all as one piece. It flows so naturally. And the melodies are absolutely exquisite. The guitar playing, Paul's vocals, you know, the harmonies, which I understand Denny Sywell did some work on that in the arrangement of the, of the harmonies. Little Lamb Dragonfly to me is one of the most overlooked songs in Paul's career. Um, really, I wish it had been placed on some of these compilations of his. Yeah, yeah. Like Pure McCartney or, or Wingspan. Um, I wasn't sure if you would accept this or not because with Ram being so respected now, Backseat of My Car is a song that I think has gotten a lot more, you know, acclaim and respect. And I think it certainly deserves that. It's a, it's a great album closer. It's like a suite. It's a song that is Abbey Roadish to me for mm-hmm. some reason. Paul's vocals are absolutely amazing. The climax towards the end when he's screaming, everything building to it. It also has somewhat of a Brian Wilson Beach Boys feel to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, Backseat of My Car is a song I always liked. These days, I just devour it. I think it's, you know, I appreciate that song. I appreciate it much more now than I ever have. Um, There's a couple of ballads that I'm going to throw in there. Not like Little M Dragonfly wasn't a ballad. Mm -hmm. But I think Some Days from Flaming Pie is an absolute masterpiece. It's a beautiful song that Paul wrote very quickly, kind of as an exercise for him. Um, And the melody is great. And George Martin had a lot to do with the orchestration on it. And um, the use of the harp on that song is just right. Um, It's one of those songs that I I believe should be noticed and thought of as being one of his greatest love songs. And he's done a lot of great love songs in his solo career, let me tell you. <laughs> but Some Days also has <clears throat> the George Martin touch thrown in as well. So I put that one in there. And I also want to throw in, and I've noticed this song has been on a few lists lately with McCartney's 80th birthday coming up, um, Too Much Rain from mm-hmm. Chaos and Creation. I love the sentiment in that song. I love how Paul explains the origin of it that it really was the result of um, Charlie Chaplin's song called Smile. Not many people know that Charlie Chaplin was a songwriter too, but in the song, Charlie Chaplin tells you to do the opposite when you're hurting. Smile when your heart is aching, you know, that kind of thing. So Paul took that idea and he used that in Too Much Rain. What what is it he's saying? Smile when your eyes are burning, words to that effect. And, it's, it's a song that um, is a great song for a consolation when you're in pain. Um, I just think, you know, it's a great three minute song, very simple bass line. I love that part that he does in there with the um, do, 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 do in the song before the next um, vocal line. Um, everything about it, it's just, you know, it's, it's very easy to overlook a song like that, but I love that song from from the first time I heard it on Chaos and Creation. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Paul has those songs like Let It Be that you need to, you know, get you through tough times, times of trouble. And uh, Too Much Rain really fits the bill for me for that one. So um, those are my five when there could have easily have been 50 more. (laughs) But uh, those I was the- writing them down, Ken. Sorry, uh, I missed cool. one. Flying to my home, backseat uh, of my car. Little lamb, dragonfly. Oh, I didn't. 
I didn't write that one. Okay, there we go. The backseat of my car, some days, and too much rain. Good choice with too much rain. Okay. Um, all right, so for my list, um, there was one song that I was going to pick, but it's a tune I can't listen to. It's too sad. And that's the end of the end. I just wanted to give that an honorable mention. I can't deal with Paul on the, on the day that I die. I was like, Ugh. but that's a, that's that would that that would would have been a candidate for my list. Um, I don't know why too much rain. Those two albums. There's something very sad about just the vibe of chaos and creation in the backyard, and then of course memory almost full. Kind of to me, it's sort of the twin. Uh, the, the little brother or little sister to chaos. They oh, were released okay. side by side and, you know, uh, they're different, but I kind of look at those as being the two high watermarks for him uh, of the later years. Anyway, so my list, um, I love that you guys picked Flying to My Home and it just, I didn't think of it. Um, this one is um, a non-album B-side that I know we've talked about in the past. And I almost wasn't going to pick it because I feel like it's become one of the more popular non-album B-sides. And that is Oh Woman, Oh Why, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of my favorite McCartney songs, period. The B-side of his first single, Another Day. And that's what Alan was talking about earlier on with the gunshots uh, in the studio. Um, after Oh Woman, Oh Why, I picked... Um, a tune that I don't think was available uh, in the U.S. for many years, not initially at least. It was a B-side, Back on My Feet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. The B-side of Once Upon a Long Ago. Uh, I remember when that came out. Was it 87 or 88? 87. When that you didn't came even 86. out. 87. When, what? It's 87. 87. When that came out, and uh, around the same time as the All the Best album. And it was going to be on All the Best as the new song, the new hit single from the new Best of album, but not in the U.S. because there was little interest, I remember hearing. I don't remember where I heard it or read it, but there was little interest in a new Paul McCartney song or a new Paul McCartney single. And that was like, that was like the first time I think I ever remember What's going on? What do you mean? Are you serious? Yeah, really. <laughs> that was like, you know, a very early indicator that trends were changing, times are changing. Your favorite artists are beginning to fall into what was going to become known as classic rock. And, um, and uh, probably thanks to my friends at Beatle Fan Magazine, I probably was well aware of all the different configurations that was also around the time when a single didn't just come out, it came out as a 12 inch single in the US, three different 12 inch singles were released in the UK. Uh, everything was combined onto an EP that came out in Canada. Uh, and, and that was like, and if you bought the cassette single, you got an extra 10 seconds tacked onto one of the B sides. That was around the time when that was beginning to happen. And the CD was emerging and, uh, but for the, basic single once upon a long ago i uh, was the a side and it turned out to be a hit in england um but the flip side was a gem back on my feet if i'm not mistaken was the first mccartney mcmanus composition that we heard mm -hmm. uh, elvis co-writing that with paul mccartney a sign of things to come on future mccartney albums and elvis costello albums so back on my feet is my second pick a woman, oh, why first and third is another little trinket. And I don't did not write down the movie that this initially was part of the soundtrack. And that's a love for you. The unfinished song from the Ram sessions that sat. And then out of left field, Paul picked it up, finished it off. And it was placed on the soundtrack to the movie. The in-laws. A classic that I don't even remember. So the thing about um, the in-laws and a love for you is uh, the the director apparently or or someone involved in the production um, knew the song from a bootleg and asked Paul specifically 
if they could have that song for the film and he finished it off and and sent it over but um you know let's hear yet another cheer for the world of bootlegs because <laughs> they brought us this especially cold cuts so that's uh, a love for you this real uh, kind of that's a pretty super super obscure one there um i love the song the fourth one i'm going to pick is heather from driving rain hmm. now we know that if paul's watching right now he's probably thinking you had to pick heather um of course for heather mills second wife uh that's such a gorgeous melody mostly instrumental um would have fit on so many things that Wings did through the years. Um, and it's just that little piece at the end where there's a vocal. Um, just it's a little magical, it's a little magical piece of music for me. Uh, and being one of the few people that really, really likes the Driving Rain album, um, I actually like that kind of that, that, uh, I think they're the final three songs, not counting Freedom, where you have Heather uh, riding into Jaipur, Rinse the Raindrops. Mm -hmm. And I almost picked those two as well. Mm -hmm. The only thing about Rinse the Raindrops, which I love, that I don't really, really love, it wants a heavy guitar solo that just doesn't happen in that. But oh, anyway, so Heather. Uh, Heather is my fourth song. Fifth one, uh, I was going to drop this, but I thought, no, I'm not going to. And I didn't. More Smooths and the Grey Goose. Wow. <laughs> the finale to London Town. Um, when the London Town first came out in 78, I had just, I was what, 13 years old. And I had this thing for famous groupies, which I don't really have as much today. My affinity is switched to More Smooths and the Grey Goose. It's, um, I can't, I don't, can't even put my finger on why I really like that song a lot. It's off the wall. And yet at the same time, it's a great rocker. Mm -hmm. um, and it really ends London Town off with a, with a punch. London Town being an album that is a little more on the melody side and not so much uh, on the rough edge side, but more smooth than the Grey Goose really, I think, uh, ends the album with an exclamation point. And finishing off my list is um, is Frozen Jap from McCartney 2. I love those two instrumentals on side two of McCartney 2. Front parlor, but Frozen Jap's got that really loud, out of control drum beat in there. And uh, uh, it's just a, a throwaway that so, so many musicians wish that they could come up with regular main songs like that. Mm. And Paul just has this melody and leaves it unfinished, no lyrics, stick it on the album. Um, and it's uh, one, uh, two of the three songs opening up side two, McCartney two, instrumentals. Second of those two is Frozen Jap. I could have very easily picked Front Parlor. Um, but uh, so that's my five. Oh Woman, Oh Why, Back on My Feet, a love for you, Heather, more smooth than the gray goose, and frozen chat. So, Very so now between the three of us, we've cobbled together a large section of the set list for the next leg of the Got Back tour. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> including including they come out and they set up the bullseye and they give them the bow and arrow. <laughs> um, I almost was going to say, how about we expand this to ten? But I thought, let me leave it alone at five because, you know, there were other tunes that were popping into my head. I, I could have included Front Parlor. Um, uh, another one that I, uh, I liked a lot, um, maybe not so much today as I did initially, was, was Lunchbox Odd Socks on the Coming Up single. Hmm. And uh, I used to love when that would be on the jukebox in 1980. Because you play side two of the single and you get two songs for the price of one. Right. But anyway. It's interesting how you don't like that song as much. And then you like an instrumental like, like Frozen Jab so much more. Today. I have to listen to, I have to listen to, 
uh, to lunchbox odd socks again. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just don't, I don't think of it as much as I did back in the day. I really liked that tune then. I like it now, but anyway. I gotta, I gotta hand it to you I, that I wasn't expecting Heather to be in anyone's list, but I really think, like you said, it's it's a beautiful melody there, and actually, because the the song is three and a half minutes long, and for the first two and a half minutes, there's no vocals, right. <laughs> and then you just got one whole verse, and then the song ends, so it kind of leaves you hanging, and but still. I love that instrumental, the, the first two and a half. I love the whole thing, but it, it almost kind of works as like soundtrack music for me. Yeah, yeah. But um, it's, it's just another one of these tracks that will never become a track that many people like. It's a forgotten track in a huge catalog of albums that you find these things. You're like, the guy was a freaking genius, you know, when it came to songwriting, mm -hmm. you know. There's so many of these little treasures scattered around. I hear Heather, somebody else, uh, you know, like, can you pick some days? A great song from Driving Rain. You're going to forget it amongst the hundreds of songs that the man has written. Uh, dare I say thousands. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so. If, if Paul were listening, he would say, what do you mean was a friggin' genius? <laughs> Is a friggin' genius. <laughs> And let me go on record of St. Paul, if you are listening, I am one of the few people that did order the McCartney box set uh, yeah. that just came out. <laughs> and uh, I, Alan, you did too, I hope, because Alan, you you did good. Okay, I don't feel bad. Um, I actually didn't think it was that, that that release was that bad of an idea. But then afterwards, I thought, wait a minute, but everyone has it already. But it uh, should me that how many copies of McCartney three do we have because oh, of please. all the colored vinyl? Yeah. <laughs> um, but it made I think it still it made sense to bring them under one roof. Maybe though, maybe it's too soon though, after McCartney three came out. Maybe if it would have been something years from now, it would have been nice to revisit them as one set. Hmm. Um, but I'd still, rather go and record McCartney four. Yeah, yeah. Looking forward to the next album. Paul, get to work. Uh, and maybe he has been. So uh, that, I guess, puts a wrap on what essentially ended up being our Paul McCartney uh, 80th birthday show for things we said today. Um, and we will hold off on Ringo. As I mentioned at the beginning, if time allowed, time didn't allow, my friends. Uh, so we'll hold on to Ringo for the next show. Now, before we uh, wrap things up, let me just make a little note here. Our next show is going to be in the third week of July. Uh, just scheduling issues. We're not going to be able to uh, gather until the third week in July. Is that right, uh, mm -hmm. Ken? It's, so uh, we'll be with you in a few weeks. I know you're going to miss us. You know, go to our Facebook pages or websites or whatnot if you want to look at pictures of us uh, until we <laughs> gather again. Um, and we have uh, what will be uh, probably Check out old episodes. <laughs> yes, you can watch the old episodes, do a marathon. Um, anyway, uh, Ken, wrap things up. Uh, we want to get in touch with you. Uh, how do we do that? You can write to me at my email address, which is everylittlething at att.net. I got a few things here that I would like our listeners to know about because my YouTube channel, I've been kind of busy. Um, Today, right before recording this show, I had the chance to um, interview Jay Bergen. And Jay Bergen is the author of, let me get the book out here. I'm always waiting for a big uh, a collapse of everything in your, in your room when you grab something. <laughs> oh, it's going to happen. It usually happens when the show's not on, though. But uh, this is called Lennon, the Mobster, and the Lawyer. And Jay Bergen was John Lennon's lawyer when Morris Levy, or Levy, was suing John for copyright infringement because he, his um, music publishing company, Big Seven, owned the rights to You Can't Catch Me from Chuck Berry. And one of the lines in the song was, here come all flat top, which John used in Come Together. So there was a lawsuit and this book deals with everything that happened in the court. 
uh, of the courtroom scenes, John's testimonies. It's really fascinating. You get to see how John acted in court, the kind of testimonies that he gave. And he was just, as I was saying to Jay, he was incredible. He, with a little prep work and sometimes no prep work and just being natural, he answered all the questions that needed to be answered. And he knew what to say, he knew what not to say. He was fantastic in the court in defending himself. And um, do I have it here? I think I had it. That's the um, Roots album. I know I have it, which is the one that uh, Morris Levy put out through a TV offer, um, a mail order uh, thing that you had to get. It was only advertised for a few days. And it was the songs that ended up on the rock and roll album, plus two songs that John didn't want to release, Angel Baby and Be My Baby. And so this book deals in detail with everything that happened between John, the lawyers, everyone that gave testimony. And that included people like Jessia Davis, who was there, Eddie Matau. Uh, guitarist who was on rock and roll and walls and bridges, people like that, and May Pang as well. Um, and it's it's a fascinating look. And you really got to feel like you were in the courtroom with John as this was happening. He was as cooperative as can be. He was there every day he was supposed to be there with Yoko. And, um, and Jay was just a fantastic defense attorney for John. And everything is right there in the book if you ever wanted to know all about that. And that's on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. I also interviewed uh, Glenn Greenberg. And we just showed a few moments ago this issue of Time Magazine for Paul's 80th birthday. Paul right. birthday at 80. Glenn is the author of this issue. It's a collector's issue. And we were talking all about Paul in this show and how well, I kind of feel, and he does too, that he's a very complex man and very complicated. We talk about the complicated relationships that he's had with John Lennon and George Harrison. It's a really, I think it was a riveting conversation that I had with Glenn. Excellent speaker on the subject. I also interviewed John Tobacco. That's his real name. <laughs> he's actually a follower of this show. He's a musician, singer, uh, producer, engineer, uh, mixer. Uh, he mastered music for um, Rhino Records and DreamWorks and uh, BMG. And he's a DJ for WUSB, that's Stony Brook University's college radio station, where he does a freeform music show, which is called Clam Radio. And he wrote an article in classicrockhistory.com called 32 Underrated and Obscure Paul McCartney Songs. Kind of like what we were doing here, only we just picked five songs each. So we talked about some of the songs that made it into his article, and that's another show. And then I also interviewed Bob Berger, one of the weaklings, because of his new CD called The Domino Effect, which officially comes out July the 1st. So we talk about the new CD, uh, the music of the weaklings, and like I said earlier, he's a big Elvis Costello fan, Paul McCartney's work with Elvis Costello. And that's all in one show. And all those shows that I just mentioned are my newest ones on my YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. And please, if you can, subscribe to that. Speaking of this CD from Bob Berger, you can win it on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, as part of my weekly Beatles trivia and games page. And every week you can pick one out of 10 great prizes. If you enter the contest for the next three weeks, You'll automatically win the Bob Berger CD if you're the winner, plus the prize that you pick. So you'll get two prizes, actually, for the next three weeks. So um, and then there's my other uh, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. I'm really quite pleased, Aaron, that you said that you like Driving Rain as an album because we just did a show on Driving Rain, all of us sharing our feelings about the album. 21 years later, came out in 2001. And um, you get to hear what my co-host had to say, Joe Mayo, Tom Hunyadi, and Kid O'Toole, and myself about that album. Wish we could have had you on there, <laughs> Darren. Uh, would have been a welcome guest. I had no idea that you liked Driving Rain. 
that much. I like but, driving um, right. If yeah. you do a show on Frozen Jap, have me on. We're working on that one. Okay. Okay. So um, that's our most recent show. You can follow us on YouTube and just about every single platform. We're going to do a show on Ringo for his birthday, and that's going to be on July the 11th. It's a Monday night. Our shows are every other Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern on our YouTube channel, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. And that's it. That's it? That's right, enough. Now. That's more than <laughs> enough. Repeat that again from the top because I was writing down. No, I'm kidding. I don't think so. All right, we go uh, go over to Alan. Uh, Alan, okay, um, I can do this fairly quickly. <laughs> you can reach all of us by email at things we said today radio show at gmail.com. Um, you can find me on Facebook uh, at either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed, and we as a group have two Facebook pages, Things We Said Today and Things We Said Today Radio Show. No, sorry. Things We Said Today Beatles Radio Fans. Um, yeah. Um, Darren one day will make us yet another Facebook page, which will sweep these two away, ideally. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so... Um, you can, well, I mean, if you are listening to this, we probably don't have to tell you how to find the shows, but we hope you're listening to the YouTube version because it's video and Ken's been holding up books and CDs and things. And, you know, you want to see that. Um, and, uh, if you want to listen to the audio version, there is a, a Podbean and iTunes. There are various places that you can find these. And uh, if you would subscribe to your favorite one, um, that would be helpful to us, um, particularly if it's the YouTube one. Subscribe to the YouTube one. Um, subscribe to them all. Why not? Anyway. Click subscribe to everything. Yeah. There you go. All right. Mm -hmm. And as for moi, I'm on WFUV. You can catch me on the radio Monday through Thursday nights starting at 10 p.m. Uh, and Saturday afternoons from 1 p.m. till 4. Uh, so that's five out of the seven days I'm on the air on WFUV. Is that working? Yes. Yes. 90.7 90 FM and WFUV.org. So in the New York City tri-state area, 90.7 FM anywhere in the world. Uh, stream us, get our app and all of that. Um, so those are the hours. If you want to shoot me a direct email, email me at WFUV, Darren DeVivo, who I believe D DeVivo actually works as well, at WFUV.org is the email address. Uh, or look for my two pages on Facebook. Uh, just search Darren DeVivo. You'll probably find both of them. And uh, uh, one is a send me a friend request or click like or click follow or whatever it is now. Uh, over at the uh, other page. Again, just do a search and you'll be able to track them down. And I think that uh, that's about it uh, for this uh, Paul McCartney's 80th birthday celebration on things we said today. As I mentioned a little while ago, our next show is coming up right now. Today is the last day of June. It's June 30th that we're recording this. Uh, so it'll be three weeks uh, the third week of July, we'll be back with our next show. So we will see you then there. And uh, for Alan Cozen, for Ken Michaels, for Darren DeVivo, thank you so much for watching. And we will see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>